on The Real Mr. Beer, Mr. Beer's own Twitch channel. Uh, we're here to provide homebrewing guidance and tips, equipping you with all sorts of beer knowledge. My name is Josh Ratliff. I'm a BJCP certified beer judge, a brewmaster for Mr. Beer, and the store manager at Everything Homebrew here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, today we're going to be brewing the Innkeeper's Daughter Sparkling Ale Refill from Cooper's Brewery. Uh, Cooper's owns Mr. Beer and we are their uh, supplier uh, for the U.S. for their Cooper's Extracts, which are six gallon kits. Um, this one is from the Thomas Cooper series and um, as you may or may not know, uh, the Sparkling Ale is their flagship beer and we'll talk a little bit more about the style um, in a moment. Um, and the first time, for the first time uh, in our stream, we're going to be doing a six gallon batch and we will be doing more of these as, as time goes by. Okay, so about the sparkling ale, um, this was one of Cooper's first beers. Um, it's called the Innkeeper's Daughter, and let me go ahead, I want to pull up the little story about that here. I should have had that up to begin with. Okay. Okay, so Thomas Cooper's first wife, Anne, uh, was an innkeeper's daughter. And so she knew a thing about brewing. In fact, when Anne became ill, Thomas used her recipe, which she acquired from her father, as a tonic for his beloved wife. This tonic went on to become the now world famous sparkling ale. Um, and, and this is gonna be uh, about 5% alcohol, um, ABV, which means alcohol by volume. It'll be around uh, about typically four or five SRM. Um, which is the standard reference method, which is the method for co uh, measuring the color in beer. Um, four or five is pretty average. That's your, you know, your pale ales, a um, little, little bit darker lagers. Um, it's going to be about 20, 35 IBUs, pretty moderate. Um, it's a well-balanced beer. Um, and the best example is Cooper's Sparkling Ale. So I'm going to get to that in a moment. Um, about the get, I want to get a little more in depth into the style um, after we start brewing the beer. Uh, so this refill, these are going to be a bit different than the Mr. Beer kits, as, as you'll see. The instructions are a bit different. Um, it, you, I'm, I know you're going to have some questions about it, and I'm here to answer you. Uh, but we're going to run through the Cooper's instructions uh, just the way that they do it. <clears throat> so this kit's going to include a can of extract. This is the Innkeeper's Daughter Sparkling Ale. Um, again, this is their, their new uh, redesigned Thomas Cooper series. It's also going to include a light dry malt, and this is when you buy the complete refill kit. A light dry malt extract. Um, this is just your basic Cooper's light dry. And it also, the kit will also include carbonation drops, um, which we'll show you how to use when we do our first bottling episode here in the next week or two. And it also includes a hydrometer. This is a very basic uh, Cooper's hydrometer. Really great because unlike the glass ones, they don't break. So they're really handy. Okay. So first thing we're going to do, I want to go over the fermenter. This is the 6G fermenter. Um, this is a, by a Cooper's design. They're really great. Uh, we sell them through Mr. Beer on our Mr. Beer website as well. Um, as you can see, it has what's called a Krausen collar. So starting off, you got your clips that keep the lid on secure. So we got these little clips here. You want to switch over to the small camera, Matt? And then it uh, also comes with your lid and a Krausen collar. And this thing's pretty cool. Because when you, as the foam rises, which is called the Krausen, uh, this thing will rise with it. So you won't have any kind of boil over or, or blow offs or anything like that or um, overflows. None of that. This, these are really great. And that also allows all the CO2 to escape. And then it comes with this spigot, which I'm going to show you here on the other camera. These are called snap taps. I can get it out of the bag and these are pretty nice spigots what I really like about these is that you can take them apart just like the new spigots for our LBKs but these are a little fancier so you can take these apart to sanitize and clean and it's called a snap tap because 
I'll bring this over here. As you can see, it just snaps right on. There we go. And it's on there nice and secure. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is start sanitizing everything. So the way we're going to do this today, instead of a bowl, I'm using a bucket. And I'm going to use a whole no rinse cleanser instead of half. And just toss that in the bucket. And then you'll fill it up to two gallon mark or just have two gallon, uh, two, two, uh, one gallon jugs and use those. As you may notice, these, uh, these fermenters have uh, uh, liters on here. So you'll definitely want to you know, be sure you're, you're doing your conversions between gallons and liters. Again, Cooper's is from Australia, so you know, they do the metric system. All right. The hydrometer comes with the kit and not the refill. The only things that come with the refill, um, yeah, I guess I should have said that. Sorry for the confusion. Um, the kit just comes with the can, the the dry malt, and the Cooper's um, carb drops. The hydrometer comes with the whole kit, which also includes uh, an instructional DVD-ROM, a brewer's log card, an erasable marker, mixing spoon, 30 740 milliliter bottles, uh, adhesive thermometer strip, the bottling valve, large beer concentrate, brew enhancer, and carb drop. So that would be the complete kit. And there we go, two gallons. I'm gonna go ahead and mix that real well with my paddle. Pour it right in here too. I just figured I'd use a two gallon mark because I'm not good with liters. Okay. So take a soft cloth, sanitize preferably. You could boil them ahead of time. This is how I like to do it. If if you have another way to do this, you can do that too. As long as you're you're wiping it down with the sanitizer, the no rinse will work pretty well. There are other sanitizers on the market that are a little more concentrated that you can actually fill the whole thing up and just let it sit for about 30 minutes or overnight, which the Cooper's instructions do say for their, their san particular sanitizer. make sure you're getting sanitizer all over everything and it really helps ahead of time but this is a brand new spigot but if you have a used spigot take it apart ahead of time and sanitize all the parts individually so we're gonna go ahead and run the sanitizer through the spigot just for a few seconds to sanitize the spigot and then dump the rest in here. And this is gonna be for all of our equipment. Okay, so the items I'm gonna to toss into the, the uh, bucket will be your can opener for the can, obviously. And you will also need the whisk. There we go. 
and of course your mixing spoon, which in this case I'm using a big paddle. And sanitize your clips as well. Okay, so like I said, this is going to be a lot different than the uh, Mr. Beer kits. The Cooper's kits, you typically don't have to boil any water according to their instructions. So we're going to go ahead and open this up. Oh, <laughs> shot across the room. And their yeast is glued to the top of there. Okay, I'm going to soak this in some water and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the style. And soaking this will help it uh, come out of the can a little bit better. Hot water. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, Australian sparkling ale um, style as a BJCP style. The BJCP is the Beer Judge Certification Program. This is um, a program that, that puts you through certification. You take uh, tasting tests and exams to become a judge so that you can go to uh, home brewing competitions or even professional brewing competitions and uh, judge different beers. Um, for this, they have their guidelines, which is updated every few years. The, the newest one's the 2015 guidelines. Um, I keep a, uh, I keep a, an app on my phone that I can bring them up whenever I'm at competitions judging. Um, the unique thing about Cooper's Sparkling Ale, unlike other beers, is that it has its own um, sub-style. It has its own category in the BJCP, which is interesting. Um, it's under Pale Commonwealth Beer, which is category 12 and it's an Australian sparkling ale which is 12B. And I'm just going to read this out to you because I think it's significant, you know, this is a very, you know, this is a part of history and you know, us here at Mr. Beer are proud to be owned by Coopers and and you know, and I'm I'm proud as a BJCP judge to say that I work for the company that created this beer and Coopers is the only surviving company that still produces this style commercially. But you could brew on yourself and enter this into competition as a 12B Australian sparkling ale. Um, and you know win some prizes if you get close to the commercial example which is Cooper's Sparkling Ale. So I'm gonna go ahead and read, read this whole thing to you. Um, I'm gonna skip through through some of it but I just want to get through some of the impressions here. So if you're not familiar with the Sparkling Ale this will give you kind of an idea of what it tastes like. They're smooth and balanced, all components merge together with similar intensities. Moderate flavors showcasing Australian ingredients, large flavor dimension, very drinkable, suited to a hot climate, and uh, a lot of the flavor relies on the yeast character. Uh, the aroma is going to be fairly soft. It's going to be a clean aroma with a balanced mix of esters, hops, malt, and yeast, all moderate to low in intensity. The esters are frequently pears and apples, possibly with a very light touch of banana. Um, the hops are earthy, herbaceous, or might show the characteristic iron-like pride of ringwood nose. Pride of Ringwood is an Australian hop, and it is um, the main hop used in, the, in this uh, beer. The malt can range from neutral grainy to moderately sweet to lightly bready. No caramel should be evident. Uh, very fresh examples can have a lightly yeasty, sulfury nose. In fact, the uh, Cooper's beer is bottle conditioned with yeast in the bottle, so they're going to be a little cloudy, a little yeasty. They're really good, though. I love it. Sparkling Ale is my favorite Cooper's beer by far. Um, so the appearance, appearance is going to be deep yellow to light amber in color, often medium to gold. Tall, frothy, persistent white head with tiny bubbles. Notable effervescence. It's going to have high carbonation, which is going to be similar to like many wheat beers or saisons. Um, brilliant clarity if decanted, but typically poured with the yeast to have a cloudy appearance. Uh, not typically cloudy unless the yeast is, ro yeast is roused in the pour, which they do recommend doing. Um, for the flavor, it's going to be medium to low grounded. Uh, grainy to bready malt flavor, initially mild to malty sweet, but a medium to medium high bitterness. Uh, it rises mid-palate to balance the malt. 
Uh, the caramel flavors are typically absent. So it's not gonna have any caramel sweet flavors. It's gonna be more, more crisp. Um, highly attenuated, giving a dry finish with lingering bitterness, although the body gives an impression of fullness. Um, it's got medium to high hop flavor, somewhat earthy and possibly herbal, resinous, peppery, or iron-like, but not floral. And this is the uh, um, this this is contributed by the Pride of Ringwood hops. Um, and it, it lasts into the aftertaste, medium high to medium low esters. Like like I said, it's often pears and apples. You'll get that in the flavor as well as on the nose, and that's also a function of the yeast. Uh, the banana is optional, but should never dominate. It may be lightly minerally or sulfury, especially if the yeast is present. It should not be bland. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip the mouthfeel. It's going to be kind of a high carbonated, um, really crisp, kind of spritzy, uh, medium to medium full body. And it's going to be a little bit, it's going to seem more full bodied when you have that yeast suspended in there. Um, Cooper's has been making this flagship beer since 1862. Although the formulation has changed a bit over the years, uh, presently the beer will have brilliantly clar brilliant clarity if decanted, but publicans often pour most of the beer into a glass, then swirl the, bo swirl the bottle and dump all the yeast in. In some bars, the bottle is rolled along the bar. When served on draft, the brewery products publicans, which a publican is somebody that goes to a pub. In case you didn't know. Not Republicans, let's not. Okay. So um, publicans to invert the keg to rouse the yeast. Uh, cloudy appearance for the style seems to be a modern consumer preference, and it's my preference as well, personally. Um, always naturally carbonated, even in the keg, and it's, a, it's, a, it's best to enjoy it fresh. This beer does not really age well, uh, because you want those fresh, uh, earthy hop characters to, to, to continue in the beer. Um, brewing records show the majority of Australian beer brewed in the 19th century um, was draft, triple X, which is mild, uh, like a UK mild and porters. Those were the most common beers in those days. Um, ale was originally developed to compete with imported bottle pale ales from British breweries such as Bass and uh, Younger, Younger Monk. Um, by the early 20th century, bottled pale ale went out of fashion and lighter lager beers were in vogue. Many Australian sparkling and pale ales were labeled as ales but were actually bottom fermented lagers with very simple grists to the ales that they replaced. Coopers of Adelaide, South Australia, is the only surviving brewer producing the sparkling ale style. <clears throat> and I'll skip the ingredients. Um, this is mostly, you know, light two-row lager. It's because it's really the, the yeast and the hops, which is um, uh, Pride of Ringwood. Um, I guess they used to, traditionally they used a Cluster and Golding until it was replaced in the 60s uh, with Pride of Ringwood. Um, <clears throat> it's got a highly attentive Burton type yeast. It's this. This is a the Cooper's yeast is the same yeast that's been used for for a hundred for like over a hundred years, and it's um it's what it's the same yeast under a lot of our Mr. Beer kits as well. And it's a really it's a really great versatile yeast. Um, it's kind of similar to English pale ale, although it's much higher carbonated with less caramel flavors, a more crisp and a lot drier. Um, and it's typically a little bit more bitter too. And again, the, the commercial example is Cooper's Sparkling Ale. So um, yeah, I think it's pretty cool that they have their own, their beer that they created is ABGP style on its own. There are very, very few breweries that can say that, um, with exception to like uh, Weihenstefan out of Germany maybe. They do have um, a couple styles that, that were based on their beers, but um, the fact that they are also the only commercial brewery making it and that people still love to homebrew this beer is pretty cool. So, and like I said, it's my favorite Cooper's beer ever. I love it. All right, so that, that uh, malt extract should be nice and uh, soft. Before we do that, actually, I'm going to put that back for a moment. Let's get that dry malt in there first. Can you dig the towel? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to sanitize my scissors here. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is get some water in here. And just to double check. Okay, we 
to use uh, we use filtered water. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and use this one because it's faster. We use filtered uh, RO water. You can use um, um, spring water, filtered purified water. Um, we try to steer clear of distilled water unless you're getting fancy and creating your own water profile, which we will go over in an advanced step, another advanced episode. going up to where I need it. Let's check out some questions. Yeah, sorry buddy, beer only here. And yes, Cooper's does use their own yeast. They do have some variations. They have some lager yeast and a few other ones as well. They, they do kind of have a few different strains. about five liters, two to five liters. And what's interesting, again, is you don't really have to boil any water. Um, just toss it all in. And as we've said in the past shows, some people don't like working with dry malt extract because of how difficult it can be. If you have a sanitized whisk, it really, really helps. And be careful not to breathe too much in. It gets a little cloudy. <laughs> See how much, how well that whisk works. It saves so much time compared to using a spoon. In like less than 30 seconds, I got that whole bag dissolved. Why not boil? <clears throat> it's not really necessary, Mini Yoda. Um, I mean, it really does help dissolve it, and it, it kind of helps a little better for our kits um, to dis dissolve it in the boil. But again, it's not really necessary to boil because they are sanitized right out of the can. And as long as the fermenter is sanitized, um, you don't really have to worry about sanitizing the malt. It just makes it easier sometimes. And, and if you do want to boil, so if, say you want to add some hops to this for some bitterness and you want to do a boil, I would uh, you know, do the same amount of water, you know, boil about one to two gallons, or one to two liters rather. Um, with this dry extract, you want to boil that. You do not want to boil the, the hopped malt extract. And we'll do something like that in the future. We'll do a Cooper's uh, six gallon kit um, or a Mr. Beer six gallon kit with some extra hops and kind of show you how that's done on a larger scale. Okay. Let's go back in there. All right, now let's do our brew can. loving this new can opener. <laughs> okay. And grab my, my paddle. I mean, if you want, you can use a little bit of warm water um, to do all of this so that it dissolves easier um, in your first uh, water addition, and then top it off with cold water to uh, equalize your uh, temperatures. It's all up to you. I'm just doing it all cold water. I'm doing exactly how the Cooper's instructions say. 
Okay, and we'll get all the rest of this out. Go ahead and pour a little bit of hot water in here. started dissolving. Yeah, if you boil the HME, it has a negative effect, as, as uh, Miniota was pointing out. Um, also, if you boil too much of your malt extract, you get uh, kettle caramelization, um, which will darken the malt and it will caramelize some of the sugars, rendering them unfermentable, so your ABV will be a little bit lower than normal, and it may end up sweeter than normal. So you want to avoid um, boiling all of your malt at once. Um, if you have a light dry malt extract that's what you, or a liquid malt extract, that's not hop. That's what you want to use when boiling hops. Okay. And these paddles work really great with these cans with the flat sides. And we do sell these on our website, so buy them. Okay. Good. And we're going to go ahead and fill this up to the 24 liter, I believe it is. Yeah, 23 liter mark. It's been a while since I've heard of Cooper's kit, so bear with me. Let's see what other questions we guys got. Yeah, boiling does make it darker. And as you can see, um, we linked the BJCP um, guidelines, 2015 guidelines. If you want to go ahead and open that, it's a PDF. And it'll show you all the different beers. I mean, it's incredible how many styles of beer there really are. A lot of people don't, don't realize it. Um, some of them you'll, I'm sure you've never even heard of. And to become a beer judge, you kind of have to learn almost all of those styles. So it is. It is quite a quite quite an affair. All right, I'm going to stir this as it's filling. Get all that stuff mixed in. This also helps to aerate the wort for when you add your yeast. There's enough uh, available oxygen for the yeast to uh, start fermenting the beer. Yeah, that's, that's true, Mini. Um, we also have a, a similar um, fermenter, which I'll show you here in a moment. I want to make sure I'm not overfilling. are the smaller guys. They also have a small Krausen collar and lid. They're two gallon capacity. So if you're doing a Mr. Beer kit, okay. these are really great for uh, the two gallon Mr. Beer kits, um, especially when they're, you're doing the really high alcohol ones, um, like the Novocaine or Lock, Stock and Barrel, which have a lot of malt in them. These will prevent an overflow because of the Krausen collar. Oops. I'm going to let that settle for a minute. And just like the six gallon ones, it has a crown color, which will raise with the foam as it ferments and let CO2 escape. 
So these are really great. We also have these on our website. Um, they're a really great upgrade for the uh, two gallon Mr. Beer kits. In addition to the fast ferments, which uh, I'll do a fast ferment brew um, in a future episode as well. have six gallons of wort. I took our sanitized collar, put this in, and this will stay in for about three to five days um, until the krausen falls and it's not lifting it anymore. And you can go ahead and take it out, clean it, sanitize, put the lid back on. Sanitize lid. Yes, I will get to that. Thank you. And of course, that stuck to the table or yeast. But before I do that, according to the Cooper's instructions, you want to take a starting gravity reading. As I said, the Cooper's instructions are a little more advanced than the Mr. Beer ones in this respect um, for your measurements and fermentation time. So you'll take that beginning gravity reading, which I got about 10.30 there, 10.38 I think that was. And then you'll record that um, in about six to seven days, come back, do another gravity reading, um, and then you can, you can uh, take another one a couple days later, and if that gravity reading hasn't changed, then your beer is done. If it has changed, then it's still fermenting. Um, this is a way that you can ferment your beer in, in basically 7 to 10 days. Uh, Mr. Beer recommends 14 to 21 days, but that's because we don't include hydrometers in our kits and we want to keep everything very, very simple. Um, but I still like to ferment some of my Cooper's batches for two or three weeks, um, kind of keep them on the, on the sediment, um, get the clarity down a little bit, and then bottle. But either way is really up to you. our yeast in there. And again, stirring is not really necessary. Um, the yeast will find the sugars. They do need um, a little oxygen to start, so keep them up towards the top, I think is beneficial. And clips. All right, and that guy's good to go. And yeah, if you go to that link that was just shared, um, there is a blog that I wrote about how to use a hydrometer um, with Mr. Beer kits. Easily can be converted to the Cooper's kits. It's all the same, regardless of what, um, um, how you're brewing. Uh, hydrometers work the same all the way around. Okay. All right, well, I think that's about it um, for me. Uh, if there are any more questions here, See if I missed anybody. Yep, boiling does make it darker, so that's why you want to, uh, if you do boil your water, you want to make sure you get your wort into the cold water as fast as possible so it doesn't darken too much. Um, Mini Yoda says, I asked this question a while back on the forum. Should I worry about the fermenter not being brown? Uh, Josh said, no, as long as it isn't direct sunlight. And that's correct. Um, your indoor lighting isn't going to have the intensity of UV rays as the sun will. So it's, I mean, it is best to keep it out of any light, really, but it is the UV rays from the direct sun that, that will um, skunk your beer the fastest. Okay, so 
Uh, I want to bring on Rick. This is uh, Mr. Beer's president. Um, Josh, Josh, all of this brewing has really made me thirsty. Uh, <laughs> so I'm already sorry. I know, I need a beer after this too. Um, you know, I had a question though, before yeah. you get started on that. So you put it over here. What is it? What temperature was it sitting at? Um, you can ferment anywhere from 69 to 80, I believe they say. Um, I can. I like to ferment a little cooler, actually, like 65. If you do that, you want to ferment it a little longer. Um, that kind of keeps some of the esters down. Um, but if you want to do it two style, do it 69, 72, and you'll get those nice kind of pear apple esters that that yeast is known for. Nice, nice. All right. And uh, so Scott, or uh, Rick is going to be talking with Scott Harris, who's visiting with us from Australia. He's the uh, um, marketing manager for Cooper's Brewing Company. And uh, these guys are going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the refill we just brewed and some of their other refills and a few other subjects as well. So what are you guys going to talk to us about today? You know, everything about Cooper's is about history. So we're going to go over the history of all of these Thomas Cooper's uh, branded cans that are out there now. So uh, why don't I leave you up to answer any other questions that anyone okay. comes up to and you'll see us in a minute. Yep. All right. And if anybody has any questions, uh, if not, I'm just going to go ahead and transfer it on over to uh, Rick and Scott. All right. Uh, I guess any more questions will be answered at the end of the show if you have any questions for uh, Rick and Scott. Um, feel free to throw them up in the chat. I want to thank you guys for joining me on my brew, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Uh, you know what? Really appreciate you brewing that for us, Josh. That was really, uh, I think, informative for everyone that has typically known us for our Mr. Beer uh, brews. And you know, we're going to be doing more and more. Uh, but uh, right now, I'd like to, to introduce you all to Scott Harris. He's the product manager of brewing products at the Cooper's Brewery. Welcome Thank to you. the U.S. Thank you very much, Rick. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. He's, he's, he's over the jet lag, so we're we're really ready to go here on this. And so we've got some <laughs> really great information on here. Uh, Scott has been with the brewery for 35 years, is yep. it? Yep. So he started when he was three, actually. Yeah, correct. On that. <laughs> uh, but no, really, he's got a, an extreme amount of knowledge. And so we're very fortunate to have someone that's been at the brewery for so long. Uh, but also knows the home brew market for so long, uh, mm -hmm. and and not just in the U.S. around the world, because so, uh, uh, where where's all the Cooper's products? Uh, we're in 28 countries around the world, so all through Europe, Asia, and U.S., Canada, New Zealand, yeah, and obviously Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, in, in speaking of Australia, your the the brewery itself is how old? Uh, so we're now 153 years old. We had our 150th uh, birthday a few years ago. Uh, yeah, so uh, founded back in 1862. 1862. Yeah. All right. And they were drinking a lot of beer back then? Uh, yeah, and they still are. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, Thomas uh, Cooper uh, founded the company back in 1862, and we've still got the Coopers running the, the family company. Family owned, been around for 153 years. We can't yeah. ask for anything more from the company that provides the malts for Mr. Beer, for the Coopers uh, uh, branded products. Uh, and then what uh, Josh just went through today was the Thomas Cooper's brand. Yeah. And so the, that that particular brand itself has been around for a while. When was yeah. when did we have those around? Well, we had an original uh, edition of the Thomas Cooper's brands back in sort of you know just the early 2000s, uh, but we revamped them recently to take more of a, a craft line. So yeah. early 2000s, and you actually started in the late 70s for, for the brewing products? Yeah, yeah. So what happened was uh, back in the late 70s in Australia, uh, the government legalized brewing at home. And uh, so we first went into brewing back then. And uh, the, the original brews we did, uh, the home brew kits, were actually a uh, 20 liter bag in a box. So quite heavy to carry type things and not very concentrated. So, so, so that was kind of like the wart that Josh just made. Yeah, kind exactly of. right, like a wart bag. And uh, and they were great, uh, except when we transported them around the country, the, the bag would rub against the box and they'd burst and split. And so, so they could get a bit messy. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, it wasn't very complicated brewing. It was basically adding some yeast to the bag, pricking the corners, let the bag swell up and uh, ferment. And then when it dropped, you knew it was ready and you'd make your beer. Yeah. Now, so, brewing in Australia is, of course, the, the home brewing itself is a, uh, a hobby kind of thing, but yeah. really it's, it's a, a, a more economical way yes. for Australians? Yeah, and exactly right. So, so the 
in Australia, homebrew took off really originally because it beat the tax man. Uh, so we're highly taxed on alcohol in Australia and uh, people could make a beer for sort of, you know, five or six times cheaper than they could buy one, mainly because of the tax issue. So that's why it hadn't been uh, legalised until the 70s when they went, no, it's fair enough, we can do that. Is, yeah. that, is that similar around the world? Are there other countries that are more yeah. economical? If you uh, look at the world, we've got cost-saving markets and we've got hobbyist markets for brewers and the traditional uh, cost-saving markets, they're really the ones that are highly taxed. So uh, originally it's Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the Scandinavian countries, so you're Sweden, Finland, Norway, and they were all traditionally highly taxed on alcohol and so they were the big homebrew markets that took off straight away. But then a lot of the others grew as well. And the UK was in there as well, actually. Yep. And so back then, really hoppy beers were really the more preferable one, right? Uh, yeah, they were. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Over time, it's gone from the old hoppy beers to the lagers and now back to the hoppy beers. So it's sort of been a, a cycle. Yeah, that, that was yeah. really interesting. Uh, uh, Scott shared with me an article that talked about this history of the styles of beer, which was really, really interesting to show that this craft movement is just uh, an evolution of what happened a hundred years ago, something yeah. like that. So um, yeah. our, our hoppy beers, which we're enjoying a uh, an IPA right now uh, on there, and that takes us back to the Thomas Cooper brand. So let's, yeah. uh, as far as those cans go, uh, I know Josh uh, already explained a little bit about the sparkling, but mm -hmm. the sparkling is what? Uh, yeah, okay, so we'll take a step back. So uh, Thomas Cooper founded our brewery in 1862 and how it actually came about was Thomas's first wife, Anne, uh, she got ill and uh, her father was an innkeeper and uh, he had a tonic and uh, so Thomas brewed up this tonic and gave it to Anne to help her and she did get better, luckily, so that was good. Um, but at the same time, some of his neighbours tried it and they thought this tasted pretty good. So they said, could we get some of it? So he said, sure. So he started making some for them. He made some for other people. Then he got to the stage where he was making so much of this stuff, he started delivering it by horse and cart. And that was really the start of the brewery. And that first beer that he made became our sparkling ale. So uh, this tonic, I mean, he, he knew what it was, right? <laughs> he knew what it was. He knew it was beer based. Okay. It was back when uh, malt beverages were considered healthy and good for you. Because remember back then... I still consider them good. Oh, me too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's why we look so good. Yeah. Yeah. But the, there was also uh, this whole thing about uh, the water wasn't that good. So brewing beer made the water better. So there was that sort of feel as well. So yeah, it started off as a tonic, but then grew into what's now our flagship beer, the Sparkling Ale. So that was the first beer. Uh, any, so it's called the innkeeper's daughter. Yeah, in, in, in honor of the fact that it was brewed for Anne and her father was uh, an innkeeper. Okay. And so it's innkeeper's daughter, Sparkling Ale. And probably another interesting fact about that, we get asked a lot why it's called Sparkling Ale and you hear all these different, different reasons. The real reason is that it's similar method to champagne in that it uh, ferments in the bottle, secondary fermentation. And, you know, uh, champagne's sparkling wine. So that's where the sparkling comes into it. Got it. And that's yeah. one of the main differences of the Cooper's beers than many other that we know if we go pick up something in the store, yeah. uh, that's uh, uh, the carbonation is totally different because of the secondary fermentation? Correct, yeah. Uh, all our flagship beers like our ale and sparkling ale, pale ale, they're all uh, bottle conditioned. And, and what that means is, yes, we, we can do uh, initial fermentation for the alcohol, then we bottle them, we reseed it with some yeast, and then that gives it that uh, secondary fermentation that gives the, the beer its carbonation. It also uses up all the oxygen in the bottle, which means it has much longer shelf life. Uh, does it change in the bottle over time? Is it one of those things like wine where it gets better over time? Uh, does it, it have a, a best by date on it? Well, we put a best by date on it over two years. Um, what will happen over the period of time though, it will get more estuary. And so some people love that. We have winemakers in Australia that, uh, that sell it our uh, sparkling ale and it got so popular that we actually do an aged sparkling ale and an aged stout now in Australia, only in kegs. But yeah, um, it, it's a beer that you could drink four years later and it's still fine, but it will be different. It will be much more uh, creamier, it'll be uh, yeah more esters, more, okay. more character. Okay. Some people like that, some people prefer to drink it fresher. So this is a, a real 
we could say benefit, we could just say this is something that Cooper's does very different than other breweries, but are there any other breweries that do this? Well, the original method's called Burton on Trent and it comes from Yorkshire, which is where Thomas comes from. So he sort of brought it over from there. There's not many breweries left doing exactly the way we do it. A lot of breweries nowadays uh, they filter the beer. Having said that, a lot of the craft breweries that are now coming out, they're using similar methods. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, for bottle conditioning. Maybe not exactly the same, but similar. Yeah. Got it. Is the sparkling maybe the lightest in color or one of the lighter in color ones? One of the lighter in colors that we do. Um, yeah, yeah, one of the lighters in color. Oh, still reasonable alcohol content. Yeah. That's about 5.8 in a commercial sense. Yeah. Got it. So moving from the, uh, the sparkling ale, uh, how about we talk about a, a Pilsner that you've got now? And sure. that is the, uh, uh, the 86 day? Yep. What, what is the history on 80, 86 <laughs> days? I mean, is there a yeah. random number here? What's yeah, we on? just plucked it out. No, um, so when Thomas left uh, Yorkshire back in uh, 1852, there was him, his wife, and his two daughters, and they sailed across on the SS Omega, it was called, and it was a pretty tough voyage, and it took 86 days for him to get from Yorkshire to Australia. And it was a bit of a tragic circumstance because he, uh, one of his daughters died on the way, uh, and another one was born on the way. So it was a very adventurous and it was the same story. number. But yeah, yeah. Pretty tragic, tragic yeah. Story. It was a really treacherous trip. It wasn't like you know an easy voyage. So yeah, so it was 86 days was uh, was how long it took him to get over here. Yeah. Was he thinking about this? So was he thinking about brewing? Did he have that knowledge already at the time, or was that just? Uh, no, no. In actual fact. Uh, he had a lot of trades, but brewing wasn't one of his original trades. He really took that up when he started uh, with Ian's tonic. That's yeah. where it really came from, yeah. All right, so uh, what's this Pilsner like? This 86 days, what, what kind of, uh, what yeah. would you expect if someone was brewing it? Yeah, it's a nice, light, easy to drink Pilsner with a nice uh, crisp sort of bitter finish. Very traditional sort of German style Pilsner. Okay. So anyone anyway, outside those traditional German style Pilsners that are out there from the Bavarian region and that, yeah, they'll love it. Yeah, so it's a, it's an easy drink. If that's the case, is it better drank warmer no. or cold is really really good for that? If you come from Australia, you drink them cold. Okay. <laughs> but it's up to you. We usually drink. Yeah, I, I'd always recommend lagers They're cooler. That's yeah. right. and you know lagers are the most popular beer in the U.S. Yeah, and b by a landslide. Worldwide by a landslide. Worldwide. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean, there's certainly been an explosion of craft beers and that, but still lagers are the biggest. In, mm -hmm. in the world as a and do, is is it because of it's that that clean crispness why that's the case you think and and this is just our, our, our observation that we're seeing is most popular but yeah i think uh depending on what climate you're in too as to what sort of beers you like you know if you, if you go to the uk sort of uh, for instance although lagers are still the biggest seller you know um, the older style english bitters and heavier beers are more popular because of the weather you go to the, the warmer regions, they've always drunk light, easy to drink lagers, uh, crisp finish, and the, obviously the Germans who are the, and the Czechs, the beer kings that started the whole thing off, they're all lagers. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Well, then we get to, um, speaking of lagers, mm -hmm. the, the Golden Crown? Yeah, so, so traditionally for uh, Coopers, we've always been well known for doing our uh, bottle conditioned ales and stouts. So like we were talking about earlier, the sparkling ale, we do a, a, an extra stout, we do a... Which a stout is an ale, yes, right? Yes, it right, is okay. an ale, yes, correct. Although we usually refer to it as stout. So uh, yeah, we do those. So that's what we've traditionally been known for. And um, we started in 1862, and it wasn't until 1968 that we actually ever made a lager. And that first lager was called Gold Crown. And so yeah. this is a similar recipe to our very first lager that we ever did back in 1968, which was interesting because Max Cooper at the time was one of the directors and he said, we should be making a lager. That's what some of our people out there want. And some of the other people said, no, we should stick to what we're doing. We want to stay with ales and stuff. So there's a little bit of family sort of argy-bargy for a while. But you then mean a family <laughs> inviting? Hard to happens. believe, yeah. yeah. But, uh, well, and, and, and really, I mean, the family, the, the Cooper's family, would he have like two or three kids when he got over here to, to Australia, right? Yeah. And yeah. how many did he have? 19. N 19 <laughs> kids. Yeah. So Stout's very good for you. Stout is, <laughs> is, yeah, if you want a lot of kids, you drink a lot of stout. <laughs> so, yeah. So Max sort of pushed the whole, yeah, we should do a lager. He got it through, we got it out there, and it was very successful. And uh, it actually helped with our volumes going up dramatically back then. So so Gold, Golden Crown was uh, 
was a replica of what we did as our first commercial lager beer. Now, now yeah. when you introduced those things, did you guys, I, I know uh, Cooper's has always had unique uh, marketing. Yeah. That. Was Golden uh, Crown, you know, the same way? Did you have like a well, gold crown that goes on it? <laughs> not really, you know, back in that time, um, they didn't have much marketing money, to be honest. It was more about uh, just make the beer and put it out to the pubs. And there were so many pubs back then too. and. Uh, there was no rules on who you could sell to and who you couldn't. It was just get out in a horse and cart and deliver it. So there wasn't a lot of marketing going on back then, to be honest, apart from different labels. It wasn't until sort of later on when we actually got a bit more money coming in and got a bit more, uh, a bit more savvy, I suppose. We um, we started doing that sort of marketing. Yeah, early on we didn't really do a lot. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So so that's the lager, which kind of brought you into it totally different because you are known for mm. your ales and your stouts. Uh, and so now you have a lager. Did the did the brewery have to change at all when when you did that? Did you yeah. did you expand specifically for that because it's a total different yeah. brewing process? Yeah, and that was part of the issue is that you know you can't just go we're going to make a lager. We didn't have a lager cellar. We didn't have all the equipment we needed to store lager at low temperature. Unlike you know the ales and stouts we were doing at that sort of higher temperature, um, around your 22 sort of degrees. Um, to Celsius. Celsius, sorry, right. speaking in Celsius. But yeah, so we actually had to invest in equipment to do it too, and that was part of the reason why there was a bit of, oh, should we be doing this or not? Because it wasn't just, yep, here's a bottle, fill it up. It was, okay, let's get a, let's get the uh, lager vats, let's get the lager cellar, let's get it all set up so we can do everything correctly. And, yeah. and at that time, we were still talking about horse and buggies. Yeah. Right, I mean, so this is not like how... Was, we might have had a truck by 68 I think but yeah that was still it, it was still pretty kind of, basic pretty basic kind yeah. of stuff that we're talking yeah. about yeah correct and so then you, you kind of uh, and, and these aren't in chronological order but no. now we're talking about our pale ale and yeah. this is one of your real namesake beers as well right yeah yeah although the uh, and so pale ale for us was bought out originally in the commercial sense as a as a lighter version of our sparkling ale so our sparkling ale is 5.8% alcohol and our uh, Pale ale is a 4.5 percent version, but it's basically brewed very similarly. Um, now, this one, uh, the Thomas Cooper one that we're talking about here, the, the actual bootmaker, is that the same thing? No, the bootmakers is more of a um, U.S. style pale ale, so it's got the hop character in it that you would expect. Our Australian pale ale is in our other series of cans, in our international series, that will replicate what we what we sell in Australia. But the bootmaker. Uh, was uh, more of an American style pale ale, more of your West Coast sort of pale ale finish. Got it. So that's yeah. the that's what's your Nevada really popularized popularized here in the United States is that style of pale hop forward, a little bit more aroma to it. As yeah, well. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I look Sarah and Bart make great beer. So yeah, yeah. Um, so that sort of style. Yeah. So the bootmaker. What what's what's that about? <laughs> well, you asked what Thomas actually did. So. Uh, one of the things he actually was, was a bootmaker. So when he first came to Australia, he was actually uh, a cobbler going around fixing people's shoes door to door. And- I uh, thought that was just the name of the street. <laughs> a cobbler, no, that's where it comes from. He was, he was doing that and he, uh, interestingly enough, one of the places he actually used to go down and, and sit near and, and fix people's shoes, ended up becoming the first hotel that he had his beer in. So, so just, to, sun. just to clear, clarify here, because uh, I've only been to Australia three times, and when I was told that I needed to go get drink some beer at the hotel, I'm like, that's usually where you sleep at. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, in Australia, they're hotels, but they're also front bars. So bars in places you can stay at as well. Yeah, but they're more traditional bars, more like English pubs. Yeah, okay. yeah okay. so slightly different. So yeah, he was actually, by trade, a shoemaker. Yeah. Got it. Hence the name Bootmaker. Yeah, Tonics. correct. So, so he was doing everything for his family. He was making tonics. He was, he was a medicine man. He was a bootmaker. He was... He's very busy. He's very busy. <laughs> Especially for 19... You have to be able to do all this stuff if you have that many mm. children. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah, that's right. So you've got the pale ales. You've got, mm -hmm. you're, you're really... You have an expansive uh, uh, catalog of products here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the IPA. So is the IPA that old as well? Yeah, so um, Brewway, so back in our, uh, back in the brewery, we've actually got Thomas Cooper's uh, original recipe book and his diary. And uh, his first brew he ever did was called Brewway, very original. Yeah. The next one was called Brew B. So yeah, <laughs> you can follow it. Okay, he could do a lot of stuff, but he wasn't very good at the name. <laughs> no, no, he didn't do the marketing. 
So what actually happened was uh, his brewery was made up of whatever he had lying around. And he called it a pale ale, but in today's terms, because of the amount of hops, Kent hops he added in there, uh, it was close to an IPA. So when we were talking about uh, this sort of thing, it's not the exact brew that he made, but it's in the tradition of what he did back then, which is the very first brew, which is a brewery. So that's our brewery IPA. So, yeah. so is, is that kind of coming around to that story about, you know, IPAs? Uh, yeah. Putting a whole lot of hops in there for the beer to last long. Was yeah. he thinking about that at the time? No. Or was it just, hey, this tasted really good? Well, actually, he just said, what have I got lying around I can make a beer from? <laughs> <laughs> and it happened to be, he had all these hops sitting there and uh, some of this water that he uh, sanitized. So he said, right, I'm going to throw all these in here and I'm uh, going to measure it. And, uh, and then he wrote down what he'd done and uh, tasted it, sold it to his friends wrote down in the book, yep, I sold those for, uh, it was seven shillings a dozen back then. He sold it for it as uh, his first ever sale commercially oh, of wow. a beer like that. So uh, yeah, it was really just, this is what I've got lying around. I'm gonna make a beer out of it and see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, one of the things that uh, I don't necessarily, is not necessarily my favorite kind of beer is a, is a wheat beer, but we also have that category in these cans because we want yeah. to be representative of all the different categories of beers. And this is a really good wheat as well. Yeah, yeah. and wheat's really growing quickly. So uh, I noticed just wherever we go now around the world, there seems to be a big trend back towards sort of wheat beers or wheat combination type beers. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad we got that in the range. And uh, you were saying how Thomas was so busy. Well, he, besides all these other things he did on Sundays, he was a preacher. Uh, he actually used to oh. go down and preach, and uh, so he's a Methodist lay preacher. And that was back in the days, like I said, when they said malt beverage was good for the working man, kept him healthy. Mm. So they actually thought it was good he was a preacher and also a brewer. <laughs> Probably not quite the same nowadays. Uh, yeah, so uh, so that's how we got preachers happily. Uh, that's where that sort of story comes from. And, so. and what, what time period are all of these coming through? Is, did, was he making like one a month or was this over the course of time as he's uh, kind of developed? Because really, I mean, there's no beer company yet. He's just doing this to sell it. He's, right? just, uh, he's just making, making uh, a living. Yeah, making stuff in his backyard basically to start with. In, in, uh, in 1862, when he actually developed the first brewery, it was um, not, it was the original sort of big home brew I would call it and then he moved in uh, in uh, 81 we moved to the Leebrook site where we stayed for the next hundred years uh, yeah okay so, so yeah. It, it's very similar to what craft uh, uh, craft breweries and micro breweries are doing they start up small maybe a few barrel system or something like that yeah now, granted, it's, it's much more sophisticated now uh, yeah but, but in in reality, you're starting out small, building the company, building the name, building a, a group of products that is really good, Yeah. and then just uh, continuing to grow. Yeah, and I mean, really, he stuck with one beer, really, uh, after a couple of little trials on things. Uh, you know, he really stuck to sparkling ale for years before he mm -hmm. introduced anything else even. You know, stout came next, but then he, he sort of, from there, we, we grew, yeah. Got it. So we've got the family secret. <laughs> well, this is what was interesting. Uh, Thomas Cooper had two wives and 19 children, and then their children had children, and then their children's children had children, and so we're now at the stage where we've got the fifth and sixth generation Coopers running the, the brewery. But of course, if you look at the family tree with 19 kids, there's just lots of Coopers. And uh, of course, all the way through this, you know, um, there's family secrets, and that's where this sort of came from. And um, uh, Max Cooper was in there and he had his recipes and luckily one of them was Amber and we always say well, at least that wasn't a secret so that's good. So uh, yeah, it, I guess what's interesting for most people is the fact that first of all he's got 19 children, secondly that uh, we've still got the Coopers running us and so at the moment we've got uh, Tim Cooper um, is our managing director, uh, we've got four Coopers on the board, uh, Melanie Cooper who's Tim's uh, sister is our director of corporate affairs and uh, company secretary um, and uh, we've got Andrew Cooper who's the sixth generation who's Glenn Cooper's son working there so it's all very still Coopers you know that they always say that the difference about Coopers is you can always meet a Cooper there so um, yeah and it's nice to know that they're a good family so it's just and, and our structure of the company is such that the uh, the shareholders are all Coopers and they can just move the shares between Coopers but they don't get sold outside of there. And, and if I remember correctly, maybe it's, it was 
five years ago that it, the, the Cooper's Brewery was listed as one of the, the best family owned companies in the world. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, a bit like I. <laughs> yeah, evidently. So, yeah. So, yes, that was nice. And it's a good spot to work. Yeah. yeah. We don't have much turnover. Got it. <laughs> got it. And so, then the last one in this uh, uh, grouping of home brew products that we we just came out with a, a, about a year ago. Yeah, when they all got brought in. Yep. Uh, the Devil's Half. Yeah. I think that's probably the most interesting name. Probably because yeah. it's, it, it's just got, it, there's a story there. <laughs> So I mentioned before that, you know, when Thomas started uh, getting a bit more commercialized, he, he set up his first brewery in an area known as Norwood in Adelaide, and that was in, um, uh, in, in 1862. And the area it was next to was called the Devil's Half Acre. And it was called that because there was a lot of, uh, quote, menacing people that used to hang out in that area, and unsavory people. And so they said getting from one side of it to the other side was like running the gauntlet. So they, they, it was called the Devil's Half Acre. So when we wanted uh, to do a, a dark style beer, we just thought, oh yeah, well that's in good memory of the shady people that live in that area. So yeah, it was well known around our town. You don't go there after dark. You don't go there. <laughs> good place to put a brewery. Yeah. So yeah, so the brewery stayed there for a few years until, until moving across the Lee Rock. All right, and so this is a ruby porter, and that's a, a, a little bit red color in there? Yeah, it's got a bit of a nice red sort of crystal sort of malt through it to give it that sort of nice uh, ruby sort of appearance. Easy drinking, dark beer. Yeah, what kind of alcohol content is it? Is it yeah, it's sort of under five, mm-hmm. but it's um, it's uh, lower bitterness. It's easy, yeah, not easy. like a stout with a high bitterness and the dryness. This is much smoother, easy to drink, yeah. Got it. Do you have a favorite? Out of, out of all these, we got the, the Smarling, we've <laughs> yes. got the, the Pilsner, the Lager, the Wheat. Is there one that, that you really, uh, when you were doing this, you're like, oh, I really like that one, and yeah. I want to make sure it's in there. Well, I like hops, so Bruet. Oh, the yeah. Bruet. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so Bruet's been my favorite just because I like that beer style. Um, but yeah, I like, I like the Porter, too, just as something different. Yeah, yeah, so I, don't know, I like all beer. Yes. Some are just better than others, but yeah, yeah. The, I, I'd go the IPA myself. Got it. So, so we've got uh, the Thomas Cooper's category in our mm-hmm. home brew. Then we've got, I know you mentioned it earlier, with the, with the regular pail is in the international series. And then you've got an American series? <laughs> no, 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 an original series. An original. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. What, how many total do we have? Uh, we have now, uh, that's a good question. What do we have? Five? I think it's 20. 20. <laughs> okay, head. so yes. I mean, that, that's a lot of different beers, and I know that on the Mr. Beer side of things, we, we do lots of different recipes, mm. so do your home brewers kind of experiment with that kind of stuff, maybe putting a different brew enhancer in there to give it a little bit different? Oh, for sure. You know, a lot of our guys start off, they're quite happy just making the, the can as we recommend, and that's a good, quick, simple way to make a really good beer, and some will stay with that. Obviously, they, they experiment with different styles, but then we also get people that, that'll start adding extra grains, extra hops, they'll, they'll make it slightly different, you know, tweak the yeast they use. We've got a lot of recipes on our website as well that people can look at. We do recipes of the month where we put together what we think is a good recipe. Some of them are just ones that, that our master brewers make up. Um, and then other ones are actually, we get asked for a lot of clone recipes, like how do I make this beer or how do I make that? So we do a lot of those as well, but using the extracts as the base. Yeah, and, and you said something really uh, interesting there is the, the master brewers. I mean, there's mm. something to that name, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Just, it, it means something when you become a master brewer. Yeah, yeah, we've got three master brewers uh, at, uh, at the, at the uh, brewery, because uh, we are a brewery. I guess that's the difference is we're a brewery. So, you know, we're making beer, and when we, when we make these extracts, we're not making mold extract and doing, you know, squirting in some hops. We actually kettle it through the brew house and make a lot, we're making a beer. Then we extract it gently. So we don't caramelize it when we make a good beer, but it's all overseen by our master brewers as if they were making a commercial beer. So yeah, it's really important. And you know, Tim Cooper's um, head of the uh, brewing um, federation at the moment. So it uh, keeps him busy. He goes to Europe four times a year for that, to head that up. So yeah. We've got good backup as far as the breweries go, <laughs> and access to all the best uh, um, best uh, equipment and also all the best uh, ingredients, which we've just put in a brand new maltings plant on site. So I think we're one of the few breweries that has its own malting plant on site now. So, so if I remember, I mean, yeah. so you have your own water 
well there. Mm -hmm. So you are managing your own water mm -hmm. and goes through a huge filtering and then you add in the right mi minerals. Mm -hmm. You have your own power plant mm -hmm. on the facility. Um, uh, you've now got the maltings plant, so you're really almost farm to glass in yeah. a sense. Yeah, definitely are. Yeah, our, our agreements now are directly with the farmers. We're like we're in the barley belt in South Australia, so a lot of uh, Australia's barley comes from just up above us, so that was easy for us to get the barley in, just trucked in nice and easily. Um, yeah, and we generate our own power. Uh, we have our own water supply. So no need for Elon Musk to come over by the Well, it was quite interesting actually, as everyone probably heard, Elon's building a great big battery in our backyard in South Australia because we've been having numerous power blackouts. And when we had the last power blackout, the only place that was still going was our brewery. <laughs> the generator <laughs> going. That's right. So uh, yeah, no, it's been really good. And we, we generate, uh, we use the steam that's uh, created during the brewing process to help generate. Uh, the power, and then we actually feed power back into the grid. Yep. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, the water supply, we have three wells there you know, that we pull from. And then, like you said, we filter it and run it from there. But the, the best, the, the Maltings is only a new plant that we only built, uh, we only, it was only commissioned in November last year. And that's really given us that whole vertical integration. So we quality control wise, now we can control right from the grain to the end product, which is great. And, yeah. and since you've been around for so long, the Cooper's Brewery, I mean, these farmers that you get the, the barley from, you know, that they've been serving you guys with great products for decades. Yeah, they have. Um, the difference has been we've been buying from other malting companies all the way through. So the barley goes, we know where it comes from and everything, so we can trace back. But now, now it's our own malting plant. We can control it and malt it the way we want it to be, specifically for different beer styles. Gives us more flexibility. Also gives us uh, continuity of supply, which is really important. Got yeah. It. Anything else that you want to talk? I mean, we talked about a lot of stuff on the brewery. So is there yeah. any, any other little little secret i know and we're coming up with new products all the time yeah so i, I know that's uh, we'll probably be introducing new things on uh, on future episodes but sure. anything to end here uh no well no not really not at this stage but you know we've um we don't bring out many new commercial beers in australia that often we just bought out a new one called a session ale because that's the way things are going so that's sort of a nice fruity sort of beer so i would say that we would uh so soon replicate that on our side of uh, the business with the uh, homebrew so uh, might be something coming there got it yeah Absolutely. but we're always looking for new stuff <laughs> and that's the key i think uh, at least in our marketplace here in america as well uh, yep. everyone is always looking for uh what, what's the next recipe and, and unfortunately we need to come up with a name if we look at all the different craft breweries over seven thousand <laughs> craft breweries yeah. and if every craft brewery has 10 different recipes we're talking about 70,000 names? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a ridiculous thing. And so I know coming up with a new name for a new product is, I think, oh, yeah. the hardest part. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's interesting you mentioned about the craft breweries. That's a, this is a worldwide phenomenon now. You know, like, I think the UK is up to almost 1,800 now. And Japan's over 300. Uh, Australia went from, say, six years ago, we went from really about 12, you know, maybe 18 up to 490 or something now. So it's just booming everywhere. Yeah, so okay. very interesting. Well, Scott, I appreciate you taking the time. No uh, problem. Cheers to you. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks so very much. much. Um, I, th I hope Josh has been in the chat room there uh, answering any questions. I, I don't have the, the questions right in front of me, but um, whatever, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and check those and stick around on chat for a little while. So until then, uh, we're going to have three brand new episodes uh, next week where we'll be doing a refill, a recipe, and possibly even getting into an all grain. We don't know for sure yet on what that's going to be, but watch our channel. We're going to be putting in the uh, schedule of events and uh, you'll keep uh, up to date with all the different things that we got going on. So uh, thanks for all the questions that you put into chat and we will see you next week.